So the last year has been quite painful for the UK economy. Interest rates went up, rent prices spiraled out of control, housing sales collapsed, and of course, on top of that, the worst cost of living crisis in a generation. But on the more positive side, okay, UK consumers and households have shown they're pretty resilient. And as we reach the end of the year, there are also signs that inflation is cooling. So is there room to be more optimistic in the outlook for next year? Welcome to In the City, Bloomberg's podcast, connecting you to the conversations and the stories shaping the world of finance. I'm Francine Lacroix in our London studio. And today I'm joined by John Stebeck, Bloomberg's senior reporter and writer of the Money Distilled newsletter, also a little bit of a house pricing guru, and Phil Aldrich, Bloomberg's UK senior economics reporter. Guys, so we know that every year people just tune into the podcast to know how much their house is worth. So, John, where are house prices going in 2024? Right, well, I actually think I think they'll continue to ease lower in real terms, but I expected them to fall a lot further this year. I thought they would probably be down about ten percent in in nominal terms, which is pretty much in line with what most economists eventually came to think. But that's not happened, um, and it's been really interesting how it's been really resilient because I didn't actually think the economy was going to be a problem. I thought the economy was basically going to be a bit rubbish, but not. Terrible, which is basically what's happened. But I didn't expect house prices to stick where they are as much as they have. But I remember, I mean, last year was just, bit, we thought it would be worse than it is overall. Right, Phil? Yeah. So, uh, John, you're in good company because Halifax and Nationwide both were forecasting sort of 8%-ish falls, I think. So, And there was some even even more dramatic uh, uh, house price crashes out there. But um, I think they're going to creep up a whole percentage point. <laughs> the prediction of the yeah, year. That is it. Um, that one percentage point move by Phil Aldrich. That, that, yeah, because uh, obviously the I think the mortgage conditions are easing. I mean, it's still expensive compared to what people had a couple of years ago. And as and again, if we get massive unemployment, which I don't think is going to happen, but if we did get a, a sharp rise in unemployment, then you would start to see the kind of the kind of scenarios that John was predicting f- for last year. Yeah, that is it, isn't it? It's the jobs factor. And then also, I do think the mortgage rates is interesting. I think one thing, whenever I look at the economists' predictions, is that one thing that they tended, and I think it's because they're at a macro level, they tended to forget that average mortgage rates are not the rates that people actually get, because nobody gets the average mortgage rate. They always get the best buy rate. Mm. And so they were actually probably about a percentage point lower than most people, than, you know, the, the models were based on. Um, but even then, you know, we are still talking about, you know, it was like going up from one and a half to four and a half percent. And still all that's happened is that maybe the number of transactions kind of dropped off quite significantly. But, but you had an interesting theory. And actually, we haven't spoken to Phil about how much, how many interest rate cuts you're expecting for the Bank of England. And John was thinking, actually, it could be a way to cushion the mortgage market. So if they can't, I mean, this would be, I don't know how they pull it off, right? They, they would start cutting right at a time when people start remortgaging the most. And so you you kind of, you could get away with a softening economy, but helping out people with with new houses. Oh, you've all, I mean, you've already got that. This is the thing, because the... I mean, market expectations peaked a good few months ago, and now the you know gilt yields and kind of forward swap rates and all the rest of it are, are dropping down. Mortgages are getting increasingly cheaper. So, in a in a weird kind of way, if you haven't already had to remortgage, whatever you're facing next year is actually not going to be as bad as you'd maybe expected or planned for, assuming mortgage rates keep going down. And so, if if the transmission mechanism has been because that's the thing, the price of credit is the transmission mechanism by which the Bank of England is meant to slow down the economy. And we kept talking about how everyone's spending was going to be squeezed by rising mortgage rates. But so maybe that's not actually what's going to happen, um, at least not to that extent. But how many interest rate cuts are you expecting next year? I mean, maybe, the maybe maybe two, uh, two in the second half of the year. Um, the I, market's like out of control. Uh, yeah, well, they've right. got they've got four in for the second half of next year, or well, between May and December, and um, and then like there could be a fifth. So you 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 get you get the fifth one sort of early twenty twenty five. I think that that's too strong because actually I think the economy is going to look reasonably resilient next year. 
you know, we're going to have an election and the government is going to do whatever it can, right, to make sure that the economy is not on its knees. And actually there's a whole lot of spending uh sort of living standard boost coming through from April next year. Um, and there may be even more if they manage to squeeze in a couple of tax or a, a bit of a tax cut um, in the March budget. So I think there's going to be this kind of th this household spending power is going to start to start to really buoy the economy. So uh, why would you be cutting rates aggressively in that situation is my thinking. But but Phil, overall, how would you describe the UK economy? Because it's stagnant, so it's not great. It's not awful. Yeah. It's kind of like in this limbo. It's a bit stagnant, which I guess makes it harder for the Bank of England to set interest rates. The forecasts are all, you know, basically like zero to zero point two percent growth a quarter. I mean, it is we're basically flatlining with high higher than required inflation, which is sort of stagnation is wh where we are. The thing is, what we are going to see see is everything's relative, right? Households are going to start to feel better than they than they did. Uh, in 2023 and that's that's just purely because wages have risen um uh, so they'll get these wage rises in um january and february um uh, which are probably going to be higher than what the inflation rate is across 2024 and then you're going to get all this the benefits and pensions are resetting at inflation rates that were set in september 2023 so that's like and and, and actually for for pensions it was it was wages so you got a 8.5 percent increase in pensioner benefits and you've got a 6.7% increase in uh, working age um, welfare recipients and those will be above inflation at the time that they come through so that's going to feel like a bump energy prices are falling obviously we don't know what's going to happen the Suez Canal may cause another supply chain shock and Israel uh, Gaza could somehow destabilize the Middle East and we could get but the current outlook is you, you've got energy prices falling you know in, in April again We've got the next cut from January. You know, are we going to get income tax cuts in the March budget? It's plausible. Um, it's there's going to be a chunk of sort of spending power that will start to feed through in the second half of the year. So we, it'll be a kind of year or two halves in my mind. So we're going to we may even have a very shallow technical recession and then start to see some resilience. But I don't think there's any there'll be any urgency for the Bank of England to do straight cuts. You don't even see that happening if the economy was really tanking. So, okay, if we take a step back, there's a lot of talk about the Fed cutting. And I think that the only question that we probably need to ask ourselves, is that because it tracks inflation? Or is that because they're cutting interest rates into a recession? And that will also, I guess, impact what the Bank of England does. Yeah, I mean, I think that's driven by inflation. I think the Fed's got a mental target for where real interest rates should be. And if you look back over before 2008, even if you look at the Bank of England, so the Bank of England base rate was 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 the, the highest line and then wage inflation and then CPI was about two percentage points roughly below that consistently. So actually, if if inflation's coming down um, and the Bank of England rate is at 5.25% and inflation gets closer to, you know, three, then maybe they'd think about it. But I do... Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Phil. I think that five cuts next year is just kind of nuts. It's like, why would you, you know, do that unless unless the economy is actually running into trouble? And again, there's not much reason to say that because the other thing is in April, there's a whopping big minimum wage rise as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Now, I know a lot of companies are not quite feel able to admit that, you know, they're not actually so happy about that. But, you know, even then, I think they're going to be prepared for it. Um, so yeah, so the people's spend power is going to go up and there is that. So really, I think it does boil down to what does happen with inflation next year for the UK. Um, and it's just hard to see it getting to a point where they would cut it that far. But inflation, so inflation is coming down, but it's still quite persistent. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, the underly underlying uh, services inflation. Megan Green at the Bank of England, she she looks mm. at this particular measure, which is sort of you take the energy element out of services, and then you're looking at like really what is just embedded in 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 domestic prices, and that is basically static at about six percent, just over six percent. And uh, Bloomberg Economics have sort of they've created this uh, data set as well because it doesn't it, the owners doesn't produce it. So you can say that basically there are, there is some there are definitely underlying price pressures in in the UK. So. Uh, does inflation come down rapidly? I think everyone expects the headline rate to be coming down, but these, but then um, just because of the of the rebasing, you know, as energy prices drop, you know, automatically as 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 some goods price um, inflation from last year, from twenty twenty three, starts to drop out, you you get that rebasing. So you're going to get that fall, 
but then people will begin to point to the fact that underlying there seems to be pressure so that you'll see that you'll see inflation lift off again and if you've got because that yeah the, the minimum wage rises is, is, is another is another huge one simon french has calculated that if you put the pensioners and the and the welfare recipients and the minimum wage rise together you've got 20 million people getting uh, above inflation at that point increases in their income which is a big is a big sort of potential inflationary surge um, but this is why I don't understand. So mid-December, also, Governor Bailey warned that actually borrowing costs may have to rise again, which the market is completely discounting. I mean, why are we so sure that there won't be interest rate rises next year? I mean, I'd be surprised if there's interest rate rises, particularly if the Fed is going the other way. I mean, a lot, a lot of this does boil down to, certainly from a market point of view, I feel that it's just the Fed is the big daddy and then everybody else is just expected to fall in the line. There is also a perception, partly fueled by Andrew Bailey, to be fair, that the UK is still in dire straits compared to where it actually is, which is mediocre at worst. Um, so I, I, you know, I think there's a bit of mixed messaging coming out there, and also probably a bit of defensiveness because obviously the Bank of England was criticised quite heavily for being too not fast enough to tackle inflation. And now there's a lot of pushback from not again, not just the Bank of England, but lots of central bankers, including the Fed, against this idea that rates are gonna hurtle downwards. And I think I mean I think the answer's somewhere in the middle. I mean, my own view is that interest rates have peaked and they're not gonna go above five and a quarter percent next year. Equally, I don't think they're gonna be down as far as kind of four percent by the end of the year, because that seems very aggressive. Um and yeah, this it's just and also I guess there's a bit of irrational exuberance as well. Because markets are kind of really, they've clearly been desperate for interest rates to peak basically since they started going up. Um, and now that they've got this kind of sense that, oh, actually, that is it, everyone's desperate to go back to, you know, the kind of off to the races kind of world where like Bitcoin's shooting up and things like that. So, very speculative um, environment. And I think, honestly, I think that's it. I think part of it's just pure wishful thinking. The economy, I, and I understand that, you know, Governor Bailey keeps on saying that we're in a bit of dire straits. And as you say, it's mediocre at best. But how can you go from three and a half percent interest rates to 5.25 without something more of a shock? Is, is 2024, I mean, are we actually going to get away with having this economy be okay and then going back to normal cycles after all we've lived through in the last three years? I mean, three and a half being the what people think that the sort of neutral rate of interest will be the sort of st- the uh, where interest rates will eventually settle yeah uh, could get them to get for interest rates to get down there really quickly would i mean that would be such a stimulative effect that uh, I, I i just can't see any central bankers having just lived through a massive inflation shock just being like right this unless unless, unless yeah, yeah you're just not gonna you're just not gonna see that at the moment in uh, the, you know interest rates are below or have been below the rate of inflation and then uh, they'll soon be um, above the rate of inflation and there and so there will be a, there is effectively a um a sort of a tightening impact simply because inflation is is falling so you in a way doing nothing is still a sort of active policy especially when you think that the the equilibrium rate is about three and a half percent so you know you can see cuts coming just because you know, it doesn't need to be as t- as aggressively tightening once you've got um, the headline rate of inflation lower. But you can also see that they will be want- wanting to absolutely be sure that they have squeezed inflation out of, out of the system because it, that has been an absolute nightmare for, for them. You know, reputationally, it's been damaging economically. So it's something which you don't want to have to come back to because... As a, it would be a clear demonstration of failure as well if, if they did have to come back to inflation to, with high rates. I think in terms of things breaking, like you know the, the idea we've got away with interest rates going up so far and so fast. And I mean, I de- absolutely. I mean, I think anyone that you'd asked eighteen months ago, interest rates are going to go from zero point five percent to five point five and a quarter percent in eighteen months. They would think you know the world was going to end, um, and it hasn't. And but I think that. If you dig deeper, then a lot of that is because whether we kind of fully appreciate it or not, everyone's balance sheet is more resilient than it was in 2008. And I know I always go back to 2008. Except the governments. Except the governments, exactly. But the difference is the government is the one entity 
that has got, if you like, the the kind of the longest kind of runway. Um, now you know we might have a sovereign debt crisis, and that is the one thing I guess that if I was going to worry about anything, then something happening with sovereign debt somewhere in the world would be the, the kind of weak point. What does that look like? Well, like this a- is the problem. It's like, well, what does it look like? It's like, what happens if? I mean, I don't like, I don't see a run on the pound, or even. I mean, I, I mean, I guess the most the weirdest thing is the, the most vulnerable place would be the eurozone, but only because of the nature of the euro. It's you know, if if because it's this kind of slightly Frankensteinish still political construct, it means that if France say blows the budget and Germany's like, well, sorry, we are not going to you know help you out with that. Then potentially you could have you know the euro fracturing, but again that's kind of you know that's what happened in the Greek sovereign debt crisis. And at that point, I feel much as I, I, I'm quite a euro skeptic, I, I do think that they got the uh, institutional structures in place and the permissions for the central bank to basically do what it wants um, to patch up and, and protect the euro. So beyond that, it is hard to see. I mean, maybe I mean Japan's an interesting one if the Japanese suddenly. I mean, they, they've been very... I mean, everyone thought they were going to tighten monetary policy this year, and they haven't, which is why the yen is kind of... Yeah, and no forward collapsed. guidance either. Yeah, exactly. So um, it's that's probably interesting in terms of if Japan does tighten monetary policy at some point, there's the risk of, you know, a kind of flood of cash moving from one end of the world to another. And that might be something that causes some things to break. But uh, what would it mean for the UK economy? Honestly, I don't think it Very little. that much. I mean, I think for the UK economy, I, I don't think there's anything that's going to blow up. Um, and I think that's basically because credit has been more restrictive since 2008. And so households aren't actually overborrowed relative to where they were back then. Companies actually aren't overborrowed relative to where they were back then. And that's why everyone's coped. I mean, they've not been happy. But the bank coped. balance sheets, uh, again, yeah, are, are, the banks that are, are resilient. Well, I think that the private credit market, I think it, 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 the mm-hmm. stuff in the shadow in the shadow banking sector is is frightening because uh, the private equity, um, uh, you know, I, I, what are the valuations? What are the real valuations that no one knows? You know, a lot of the, and there's private credit, which is a lot of the private credit providers are owned by private equity companies, uh, private equity firms who own some of the companies in their portfolio that are being lent to by the private credit companies. I mean, it is a, there's a sort of incestuous issue of opacity, which, you know, if, if you would look somewhere where you go, nobody quite understands it, what's going to blow up. And it's quite a substantial part of the economy. And it's one that it feels to me like a potential subprime because nobody understands where the risks lie, how big the risks are, and, and when the valuations start falling, how, how these are declared. Um, and you could get like these big sell offs. So you could get some kind of real, I, I, say, at the extreme, some financial instability there. 2024, I think 40 countries vote. I think more than 40 countries vote. The UK has to vote before end of January 2025. And then you have the US elections. These two would, I mean, certainly the UK, if Labour gets into power, changes everything about the economy, does it not? I, I actually don't think so. Not in the UK. I don't think the difference between the two parties is that great anymore. Um, or certainly not the way they're talking. So Labour have kind of like obviously been very keen to impress upon business that we are not Jeremy Corbyn, you know, part two. Um, but we have very little detail. Oh yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, absolutely. But I mean, there's certainly the, the pitch is that there's not a lot of give in the system. So, you know, they're, they're going to have to be sensible with the finances, all of that sort of stuff. So I don't actually think it does change things that much from a market point of view. They talk about wanting to be in power for 10 years, right? And if they come in and they do something which is completely contrary to what they're talking about now, they'll be out on the next vote. I, I think that they're definitely trying to, be, you know, remodel Blair and provide a stable economic backdrop. And um in a, actually, in a, in a way, I was thinking our election is going to be between, at the moment, sort of a managerial prime minister who people think is very solid on the economy and a managerial Labour Party, which basically is saying we're going to do what he says. Um, and uh, uh, and so you have actually, in a way, got the UK for international businesses that would be quite stable because you don't have a, uh, a Le Pen 
um, or AFD or, you know, on the other side, that's a real threat. I mean, reform's just a sort of going to gonna steal votes from the Tories, but it's not a real threat. Um, so that feels quite stable. And, and then in a way, also, if you think um, that if Rishi, uh, if, if the Tories do come back in, but with a very slim majority, which is, it, I mean, that's the best hope that they would have. The, the risk is that he would then be uh, beholden to this kind of extremist right wing of the party, which could end up with the Tories being more damaging for the economy than a stable, a more stable Labour stroke Lib Dem coalition, um, if that's what it ended up as, or, you know, supply and confidence and supply deal. Um, if that's, if, uh, I mean, if there's a hung parliament, yeah, that I would imagine that we would end up having another election within, within a year or two. But um, the idea that the Tory option is by far the safest is I don't think it necessarily stands up because that, that kind of, you know, the, the, that, that wing of the Tory party that just doesn't seem to restrain itself at all anymore is, is potentially a little dangerous. Thank you both so much. Thanks. 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 Thanks for listening to this week's In The City. We'll be back in the new year. But in the meantime, check out some of our past shows and do not, please do not forget to leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts. This episode was hosted by me, Francine Lacqua. It was produced by Summer Saadi and Tiffany Choi. Additional editing by Blake Maples. And special thanks to John Sepik and Phil Aldrich. <laughs>